good, mar good morning for all of you. Uh, I would like to start, thank you, the opportunity to uh, talk about our work here. And uh, I will uh, explain what we did for specifically for Europe uh, in the production and, and construction of this Echo Data Cube for Europe. And, and and during this process, we combined um, spatial temporal machine learning, and we built uh, a data cube infrastructure to allow other organizations also to and other users and researchers also use the data. And so, my present in my presentation, I will start with the introduction and context, how we did the data preparation. We worked mostly with Landsat and Sentinel two. Uh, what is the um, our current space, spatial, spatial temporal machine learning workflow, how we are training our models and do, doing the predictions in, in Earth observation data. And we, uh, we generated several mapping products considering this uh, uh, data cube uh, infrastructure. And we used our own uh, high-performance uh, computing infrastructure. I will talk briefly about it. And in the last part of slide, everything that we are producing, it's uh, fully available and accessible as um, analysis-ready and cloud-optimized uh, files, ARCO, but also we have a web GIS portal and uh, also a, a catalog where you can access uh, everything programmatically. So let's start. So first, it's important to explain the context. Uh, this work was conducted in, uh, uh, inside of the uh, GeoRamonizer project. Uh, it was funded by European Commission inside of a, a CEF telecom program. And we developed together with uh, other uh, partners in, in Europe and the project finished now. So we have everything running and available and we will keep updating it with the new project that Tom presented that it's started last year, Open Earth Monitor Cyber Infrastructure. And so Tom explained it about it, but uh, I personally I like to think in this project like a... a uh, the, the concept of really cyber infrastructure. So here we are putting together software, mostly open source, with earth observation data, several uh, kind of multi-source earth observation data, uh, not only satellite data, but also climate data and things like that. And also, most important, I would say, the user community. So if you combine all of these um, three components in a federated system and fair compatible uh, that's the vision to, to develop the Open uh, Earth Monitor. So inside of the Geoharmonizer, when we started the project, so uh, three, uh, four years ago, uh, so that's actually when I started at Open Geo Hub, and, and one of the main uh, objectives would, uh, was help improve land cover mapping and automated predictions at higher spatial resolution. So when Tom explained, it, um, explained me about the project, uh, he had this vision to develop one single model, a machine learning model, to predict all land covers for Europe, land cover types, land cover class for Europe, but also in a spatial temporal framework. So combining also data from different uh, periods, different years. So one single model to do everything. And considering the goal to uh, back to 2000, the only data that was available considering uh, uh, the license and uh, available as open data, it's, it, it was the Landsat and it's still, uh, it's the Landsat. So, but to really develop like a framework as uh, like a machine learning model to map everything among and across this whole period, it's important to realize that we have three sensors and three satellites that composed the time series for the Landsat in this period. Now we have Landsat 9, and, but all these satellites, uh, they build the satellite considering uh, like uh, compatibility issues among the, the, the sensors, but still you have difference in uh, spectral analysis and, and, and radiometric resolution and, and things like that. So basically to make something like that works, it was important to have a harmonized time series for the Landsat. So, and we did some background research and we found this product developed by University of Maryland, Matt Hansen's group. And basically they did it here. And that's actually the input data for their products. They, and they are doing and delivering mapping products at global scale for more than uh, 
20 years, I would say, or more. So basically, I will not explain about this whole workflow here, but the important part is if you put together all these three satellites, you will have difference in the pixel values for the same land cover type, for example, for the forest, for the same area. And this difference, it's because of the sensor, the, the difference in the satellites and in the sensor. It's not something that is happening in the landscape. So it's important to have like harmonized reflectance values, harmonized pixel values across the sensors. And they did that, so they used mostly MOGIS data to calibrate, and they, they have the, they had their own uh, Landsat archive internally and like a, uh, a powerful high performance computing. And they delivered it as uh, uh, through an open API. So basically, we downloaded everything here, but it's still, it's a 16 day composite. They have like a cloud masks. So, and we did uh, some work on top of that. And basically, after the download, so we skipped the harmonization, but we did a temporal aggregation. So we uh, removed the clouds, considering the cloud mask, and we create like quarterly composites, trying to match the time of the qu quarterly composites with the seasons. So I, would, I like to say that it's a kind of season proxy. It's not exactly the seasons, because the seasons change across the years, but it's a season proxy. And we did this temporal aggregation, we did the gap filling, and we produced a complete a Landsat a quarterly at 30 meter composites, time series with four points in time for every year. And we did it for the whole Europe. So, and basically here's an example of uh, the gap filling that we implemented. So considering this uh, time span, and here you have the quarterly dates, uh, you can see that in the winter, most uh, half of the Europe is missing, basically because of clouds and problems in the data acquisition. Uh, but you have data from other uh, periods. And considering it, uh, and considering this period, you, we have like a, a eight, four uh, time steps, considering until uh, 2020. And for every layer, it's about 5.2 millions of pixels for each layer, sorry. So it's a lot of data, and we processed it internally, and we ot optimized every step of the workflow. And we did the gap filling, and of course, the most part of the uh, data that was gap filled uh, uh, it's, it's on winter, and we developed like a, our own method because these, considering the number of pixels, this is a very expensive process, and we develop a, 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 a temporal aggregation, a temporal interpolation, basically, considering the median and a kind of movie window. So basically, you have something like this, for example, for the winter, and we produce it something like this. And there is no free lunch here. Uh, of course, this data, it's an interpolated data, and we basically build a kind of multi-season and multi-year temporal composite here with pixels from different, different times. But we are delivering this product consistent, gap filled, and of course, uh, for every pixel that we gap fill, we produce like a, a metadata for every pixel. So, for example, if another user wants to try a different gap filling approach, it's it's possible, it's just a matter to remove the pixels that we uh, inserted and test out uh, different uh, approaches, basically. But it's important to deliver something like that because it, uh, it, it helps uh, the usability of the product and allows different machine learning models on top of it without uh, dealing with all these uh, data pre-processing steps. And we did the same thing for Sentinel, and for the Sentinel we uh, produced 30 meter uh, resolution, so we uh, uh, downgraded a bit, uh, down, uh, upscaled a bit the, the Sentinel data to match with the Landsat, but we also produce a 10 meter uh, uh, Sentinel 2 mosaics, so one single image, it's about 120 gigabytes, uh, and we did it for uh, since 80, uh, 2018. And here it's an example of the difference between uh, 30 meter and 10 meter. And all this data, it's available as uh, Arco, so basically analysis ready, get filled, uh, seamless, the, all the uh, similar land, uh, exactly the same land mask, so we remove the ocean waters and things like that. So that's what we call data cube. So here we have the same grid cell, the same pixel size, and not specific for the Sentinel, but the same embodying box and everything, it's a perfect stack and you can use it to uh, develop different applications and different research activities. So on top of that, 
we use it, uh, we use it as input and we develop basically three mapping products in the same project. So here it's uh, the workflow that we developed, that we implemented to uh, at the land cover mapping. And I would like to focus here. So basically considering different uh, Landsat data period, but also other uh, satellite data. So we also use night light images and different uh, spectral indices for the Landsat and digital terrain model and, and things like that. But considering these different dates and what we call a like, static or timeless data. Basically, we did a space-time overlay, so for every sample, we know the date and we know the covariates, uh, uh, the, the, we know that the dates for this, the samples and the training samples, but also for the uh, images. And basically, we match it considering different periods in time, and we trained one single model to predict uh, all the land cover class and, and in all the years. And with this model, when we have, for example, 2021, we just need to predict 2021 without retraining the model. So specifically about the machine learning framework, we use it uh, three uh, uh, basic le three uh, learners and in an ensemble machine learning framework and a second uh, level of learner that we call meta learner. So basically we use it random forest, a gradient boost trees, and neural networks. And we trained it uh, on top of that, we created a, a meta learner to uh, merge and put together all these uh, three predictions that we generated. In total, we predicted 43 classes considering probabilities, uncertainty, and also hard class. And here it's an example of what we are delivering for all the years. And there is a publication here, and this, this uh, work, Martin, will talk a bit more about it uh, in the next presentations. But it's important to say that we have hard class probabilities and uncertainty and everything is available to um, different users and other organizations. So we use the same framework to also, and the, the same Landsat data to uh, produce a 30 meter forest tree species distribution maps. So we calculated potential and realized a distribution for 16 species and for different uh, time frame here. And we here in this, with this work, we aggregated by year, uh, by, by multi-year period, and uh, Carmelo will talk about this uh, product more in detail. And also the third product that we developed, it was a soil data cube, considering also the Landsat data, but also other covariates, climate data, and we predicted four depths and for soil, uh, different soil properties and, 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 and nutrients, and basically uh, here different time steps also considering the same time steps of the forest tree species. So basically we organized this Landsat data, but we also proved the usability of it, delivering these products. And of course, uh, uh, you, you have some, it's not perfect, you have uh, 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 different occurrences for different class, but everything is available and we, the, the goal here is actually allow uh, other applications to use it and incorporate the, the, the outputs here in, in their workflow and in their research, basically. So we did that our, with using mostly our own infrastructure. So now we have 1,000 threads uh, working in, in parallel. We use basically Slurm to distribute the processing uh, workflow so we can use all the servers and all the threads together. And we have also uh, a, a cluster of storage, so basically multi, multiple uh, storage servers working together as one single block, one single unit of storage. So, and for this, we are hosting all the data using this uh, cloud object solution, they call it SIA with FS. And we do everything using Docker. So basically we develop our workflow uh, for one tile for a small region, like a pilot area in Docker. And we uh, have all the, the, the framework, all the libraries, all the versions uh, inside of this container. And when we need to scale up, we deploy everything on the fly and we use all the servers and we access all the data and produce the final maps. And the libraries that, that we use, basically, uh, we, we work with Python and R. And in Python, we are developing this kind of wrapper library. So basically here we have most of the machine learning libraries, uh, raster.io, uh, to work with raster data. But here there are several uh, wrapper functions that helps uh, with the implementation and the utilization of these different Python 
uh, libraries in a more uh, uh, earth observation uh, context, so a suitable more for earth observation data. And every, we have a full documentation and several tutorials explain how to use it in, in, in different uh, contexts, basically. And so everything that we produce, it's fully accessible through this data portal. So we have a web GIS that you can check all the class, see, for example, different years of the land cover maps and all the products that I show, uh, they are here. And, but most important, so the web GIS, it's only to visualize and have a first impression, but if you really need to work with the data, we have a stack catalog, spatial temporal asset catalog, providing all the ARCO files. So basically you can have, for example, your own Jupyter notebook or R Markdown or any kind of uh, code that you have, you can just access directly the data without any restriction to like a URL, public URL, and you can also visualize it directly, for example, in QuantGIS. And uh, here I finish my presentation and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Leandro, for this very interesting presentation. So uh, are there any questions from the audience? I have two quick questions, actually. The, the first one is, um, um, the, the data is available through your portal, but is it also available at different uh, data repositories? Because you mentioned one image is 120 gigabytes, so I think collocated data processing is important. So is it, for example, available on Google Earth Engine or other Amazon, something like that? And the other thing is, uh, did you also do a kind of um, um, performance analysis or optimizations before running? Uh, your workflows, because it's very clear that you have access to HPC, but you are also mentioning you are using Python, R, and that kind of packages. So, uh, how was your experience regarding to that? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the question. So, first, the the Landsat data, the Sentinel, the, they are available in a system uh, called Wasabi. So, it's in on the cloud, but they have a better price to host this amount of data. But the maps we also upload to Zenodo. So because the maps we can, uh, it, it's less data, so basically it fits there. We are working together with Zenodo to put, for example, the Landsat there, but it's a lot of data. It's about eight terabytes. So we need to uh, upload and organize it. But right now it's only available in the S3. So if you want to, for example, uh, process the whole Europe, definitely it, it's challenging. But uh, the idea here, and we, we are testing it with uh, some uh, partners, it's basically you can access directly your own area. So for example, maybe uh, if you want to work with uh, some area in Italy, you can just have the bounding box and retrieve the data. And you using like that, it's, it's doable. So, and you can continue the process. So it's more to uh, allow to access any part of the data in Europe, but to process the whole Europe, yeah, you need to have a HPC infrastructure. And, and for now it's only available in the S3. Uh, but we want to solve that with Open Earth Monitor, so migrating it for like public clouds and federated system, basically. And about the the second question, it's the, about the optimizations, right, with the Python and, and R. So basically, uh, everything that we do, it's with the as Tom explained, it, we develop first the workflow considering like a a, a small area. So uh, for example, for Europe, we have a tiling system, and for that area, we do all the optimizations there. So we, uh, not for the modeling, but more for to uh, predict and to generate the data. And, and considering this, this area, so basically we try to estimate how much time we'll, we'll uh, compute. And, and, we, and you have different levels of optimi optimization. So for example, in the beginning, we noticed that if you use like an Intel chip, uh, and, and AMD, Intel has like a low level library called the Intel MKL that it's three times faster, any type of numerical computation than an AMD processor, for example. And it impacts a lot in our workflow. So we decided to only work with Intel uh, chips, for example. So th this optimization also includes data access and, and, and everything. So we optimize our internal infrastructure to do it but mostly also with code. So for example, in Python, you have NumPy to do some numeric operations, but you have some other implementations that implements like core functions in C++ or even C. So for example, there was one called bottleneck, other is Num, Num Express and, and, and Numba, for example. And you can do the same numeric computation with like half of the time. So exactly the same uh, uh, 
computation like a median or an average. So basically we optimize every single step and we do like a kind of prediction of the running time. And when we have everything like properly optimized, we do the computation for the whole year. Okay, thank you very much, thank you.